In the beginning, nothing existed, only darkness and silence. There were only the creators, the heart of sky and the heart of earth. Suddenly came dawn and there was clarity. Land appeared with its mountains and trees. Right away, the animals were created, all types of animals. And it was said they had to worship the gods, but they were not capable of speech. Thus were the first humans created, and they were made of mud. But these people were not well. They had no feelings and no understanding, and did not praise the gods. They had no strength and were unable to move. So the gods destroyed these people by means of a great storm. In their second attempt, the gods made man out of wood. From wood, they carved its face. From wood, they made its flesh, and it looked like a human being. They reproduced and populated the earth with sons and daughters. But the beings of wood walked without direction. They cut down the trees, they killed the animals, and they destroyed their environment. They had no soul or understanding. They were destroyers and did not praise the gods. So death was brought upon them. It rained all day and all night, and they were exterminated by a great flood. On a third try, the heart of sky created human beings out of corn. These humans were placed on earth and were able to see and understand everything that surrounded them. They were able to see long distances and things that were hidden. They were connected to the entire cosmos and were in balance with the natural world. But the gods realized they had given the humans too many powers, so they blew a mist over their eyes. With limited vision, the human beings of corn walked across earth and reproduced. They slowly moved away from the natural world. They forgot how to praise the gods and how to respect nature. The cycle of time and the era of the human beings of corn is coming to an end. Will there be a new era for human beings on Earth? Can we evolve our consciousness to reconnect with the natural world? The economic downturns by water shortages. You can see in fossil fuels are burning up the planet. It's just not sustainable in 2012. It's going to be some type of tragedy. People don't live on a dollar. They ain't dying. Yeah. I mean, this is a spiritual problem. I don't know if we can do this. I mean, I don't know. I'm not a fan of consensus reality. We're in a very dangerous transition. I hope things get better. My name is Daniel Pinchbeck. I'm the author of two books, Breaking Open the Head and 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl. These books were really an outcome of a spiritual or kind of existential crisis I had in my late 20s. At that time, I really felt as if the whole culture I was in was a kind of materialist prison. Although most people don't want to acknowledge it, we are facing a devastating multidimensional crisis on the Earth. We are running out of fresh water. We are running out of food supplies. We are running low on fossil fuels. We have an industrial agriculture system that is poisoning people and ruining the land. So the crisis we're facing now, I mean, personally, I think it's a crisis of consciousness. Uh, we really, uh, we, we, we forget to look at the inevitable consequences of our actions as a species. I'm very alarmed by the planetary situation. I'm very worried for the fate of my own child. And I think it's becoming more and more obvious that this is a crucial time of transformation on the Earth. Yes. For me, one thing that's becoming more and more clear is how this, this system can't hold together. Mm -hmm. I don't know, does that resonate with you at all? It resonates with me. I have two children, and when I go to turn on a lamp, I wonder if, if when they are my age, 
they're going to perform that same activity in the same unthinking way that I perform it. Um, is uh, the consumer culture going to exist and function in the same way? What do you think? I really don't know. It's a question. It's a question. You've tapped into that with the subject of 2012. There is some oppression of routine that we feel in our lives that I think makes people attracted to some kind of millennialist or apocalyptic ideas. What do you personally feel about this whole 2012 thing? Well, I don't believe in apocalypse, and I don't believe in the work or the ideas of the people who try to take it in that direction. Those ideas are almost always wrong, and yet, people see turning points. We feel ourselves in a turning point right now. We are at some sort of a turning point right now. As a journalist in my late 20s, I wrote about ecological subject matter for different magazines. I found it extremely difficult to get really important information out through the mainstream media. And that's one reason I started to get more and more depressed. I really wanted to investigate the problems we're facing now and to learn from people that have been studying these crises and also talk to them about possible solutions to what we've been facing. They didn't put a dime into new technology. Pretty much any environmental indicator that you look at whether it's in terms of loss of biodiversity, whether it's in terms of uh, rising greenhouse gases, whether it's in terms of forest health, whether it's in terms of the number of toxins that we monitor and know about, you name the, the, the variable, you name the indicator, they've all gotten worse. I mean, do you think that this crisis is suggesting the whole system is going to some kind of uh, convulsion? The system is broken. It's not delivering justice, it's not delivering environmental protection, it's not delivering human rights, and it can and it won't. As I got more and more depressed, I began to wonder how could I discover if there were any other levels of consciousness, any spiritual dimensions to existence. You know, I really felt that in the modern world we'd lost any connection to nature, we'd become really alienated from ourselves, and we'd lost any connection to any form of spiritual reality. Obviously there are a lot of different paths that people can take. There's yoga, meditation, prayer. For me, what I remembered was psychedelic experiences that I'd had back in college. Because those were the only experiences I ever had where I felt I had beamed into another level of consciousness, perhaps a higher form of awareness. Folks, welcome back. My guest tonight is an advocate of psychedelic drugs. I'll ask if he does drugs, or do the drugs do him, or did I just blow your mind? Please welcome Daniel Pinchbeck. Hey, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? <laughs> Why do you have to rush it? I thought maybe we could just, just commune for a moment. I'm totally up for that. Good. <laughs> Perfect moment. Yeah, I think so too. Are you high right now? Um, no, I'm a little nervous. But a little I'm nervous? High. Okay, yeah. okay. You have said that you believe that we moderns, we place too much emphasis on our, our conscious, rational thought. You're right. saying that we should go with, you know, how the spirit moves us. Well, I'm just saying there's a whole other way of being in reality, which is kind of shamanic, intuitive, mystical form What's of What's that first word? Sh shamanic. Shamanic? Yeah, I mean, that's my, that Jewish my, my first book. No, no, it's, um... Like, do you have to wear a shmata when you're being shamanic? No, 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 no. no shamans are kind of like the uh, priests of tribal societies. They okay. kind of, they're like right. the visionaries. Like, they would go into these visionary states, they yes. would bring knowledge down and disseminate it to the tribe. Who do they bring it down from? Well, from other worlds, from the spirit worlds, in their, in their opinion. You know? So, from Jesus? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes? If, he, if he's okay. available, if he's on the line, you know, or it could be uh, somebody else. When I visited these different indigenous people and I went through their shamanic ceremonies, I also began to learn that a lot of these indigenous cultures around the world have prophecies about this time. Most specifically, the classical Maya civilization, which developed in Guatemala and Mexico. The Maya pointed towards our year 2012 as the end of a calendar cycle of over 5,000 years. 
Today, different archaeologists believe that the Maya were pointing towards that as a shift in world ages. So the evidence suggests that the Maya saw this time as one of tremendous transformation. But their culture is very different, very alien to ours. What I've been thinking about is, what do we do as Westerners with this knowledge? How do we approach this time? Looking at the indigenous prophecies of cultures like the Hopi and the Maya and the Yucatan, and the Maya have the thing about the year 2012 as the end of a great cycle on their calendar. Have you thought about that, or what does it mean anything to you? Well, from what I understand, on 2012, I don't know the exact month and date, but the calendar stops. That might be a, a symbolic uh, date of, of when, you know, the, the, the gloom and doom begins. A cable, satellite, TV, all of it could get wiped out around 2012. That's when the sun's magnetic field flips releasing a shockwave of radiation, which will then hit the Earth. An economist by trade, Gerald Salenti, accurately forecasted everything from the stock market crash of 1987 to the bursting real estate bubble. Salenti is now saying the U.S. economy will totally collapse. You can't print money based on nothing. It's not even economics 101, it's economics for dummies. Civil unrest, food riots, and a tax revolution by 2012. UN Climate Summit in Bali assumed critical importance. The aim was simple, devise a roadmap for cutting greenhouse gases when the Kyoto Protocol expires in 2012. Existe dentro de nuestra cultura una antigua profecía que viene de un calendario de los mayas antiguos. Eh, la profecía y la generación de actual termina en el 2012 y nos preguntamos si esta generación merece vivir más tiempo o habrá que eh, los creadores van a tener que exterminarlo también. So we had a green revolution in the last century where they increased agricultural yields to feed larger and larger populations. Can you explain that a little bit? The green revolution did more to disconnect people from their land, pollute water systems, deforest the earth, create the very monoculture, the antithesis of biodiversity, and create an incredible amount of dependency on corporations um, to supply seed, to supply chemicals, there's only one green that came out of that revolution. It's that green paper stuff that people get, a lot of corporations get to put in their pocket. They, they completely ignored the biology that's in the soil, turning a living system into a dead system. I think our consciousness really is changing, and uh, the more we start to realize how embedded we are in the very thing that, that many people have been trying to destroy, the more we realize how what we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. We have a situation of a world with diminishing water resources. We are actually running out of clean water. I heard your talk today, obviously, and I was curious if you have a, if there's any kind of projection on a timetable of when, like, water scarcity issues reach some kind of dire limit? You know, is it well, like... water scarcity has already reached a dire limit right. for two billion people in the world. I mean, right. it just depends where you live. As water becomes more corporately controlled, as water becomes more expensive because it's controlled for profit, uh, it's going to be denied to, to people who can't afford it. It's already happening now in communities in the global south where there's all sorts of water metering and so on. But that's going to happen here. If we think that that's far away, that's just our northern hubris. Water's the next oil. You can go for three days without oil. Try going for three days without water. Oil billionaire T. Boone Pickens has been gulping up water rights in Texas to sell it back to consumers. I know what people say that, well, water's a lot like air. Do you charge for air? Of course not. You shouldn't charge for water. Well, okay, good. watch what happens. 
you know, the powers that be, they, 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 they have gotten so greedy that they like to say, to hell with it. We're going to commit felonies to make, to, to feed our greed even more. It be the root of all your evil. A pop a bigger than your ego. Brings the worst out of the best people. Makes you lose your mind. Ah. Telling you this shit ain't funny. Folks who play you for a dummy. Talking about that money, money, money. Makes you lose your mind. You're losing your mind for what? For the dollar sign. It's out of control. The children out in Columbine. You're selling your soul because you got not a dime. Collar crime. We're hitting rock bottom line. Talk about that money, money, money. Makes you lose your mind. It seems like of all the, the people that I know that you are in a unique position at this moment in time, because in a way you've been you've been sort of preparing a whole paradigm of, of thought around this kind of financial crisis that we've now entered. And I'm kind of curious, why did you think that this would happen? Well, this is a structural crisis. You will not be able to solve climate change with the current money system. Mm -hmm. You will not be able to address the unemployment within the current money system. You will not be able to have the aging, the whole issue of pensions and all that whole social contract is not cannot be held, okay? All monies, all conventional national monies are of the same type. It's bank debt. It's created through people borrowing from banks, whether it's people or governments or corporations. That's when money is generated. So we have a monoculture. Uh, well, it's kind of predictable that monocultures are not very reliably stable systems. The, you know, the smallest little unexpected thing, and the whole thing falls apart. They have no like resilience? There is no resilience. The best way to understand it is, uh, well, let me start with a metaphor. Imagine a car without brakes, and the steering wheel is unreliable. And when you crash, I say you're a very bad driver. Nobody wants to question that the machine was actually a problem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how clever a driver you put in this stuff in these conditions, you're going to crash. That's what happens at the money system. Let's assume that you fire all the bad people uh, and put a new team back in that car with a bad steering wheel and no brakes. I'm predicting that they will break their neck again. Capitalism periodically has these crises and then it solves this crisis by restructuring its production and building new cities and, it, and if we ever get out of this current financial crunch crisis, there's going to be another building boom. And they all talked about this without once anybody saying that another building boom could just likely destroy the planet. things that, you know, what's wrong with our civilization is, is the past is constantly uh, vanishing. But it, it's part of this, this foolishness of, of sort of linear transformation that we're, we're caught up in. The Western part of the old world, the concept of time is linear. Uh, it starts somewhere in the past and it goes in a straight line. Uh, the Maya thinks cyclically. So the idea is that if something happens in a particular cycle, the next time the cycle comes up, it's going to happen in the same place. Uh, and again and again, on into infinity. It's a, it's a series of uh, barbershop mirrors in which you're just seeing reflections all along. So the prophecy and history become the same thing. There's no real difference between the past, present, and future. Siempre ex existe un principio maya eh, donde los abuelos dicen que El futuro es solo el reflejo del pasado conocido. Que nuestros abuelos, primeros abuelos mayas, observaban el paso del tiempo, observaban el comportamiento de la naturaleza, los cambios que se dan en los diferentes ciclos de la vida. Eh, de hecho, este, sabemos que ahora mismo, en este tiempo que estamos, estamos en el espacio del no tiempo. Entonces, lo que va a pasar en el 2012 es que las personas van a entrar en un, en un tiempo donde se van a dar cuenta del irrespeto que hay hacia la tierra y también la falta de respeto que hay hacia la vida. 
Well, when you say that most people are aware that the system is out of control and that it's environmentally moving towards destruction, yeah. I mean, if that's the case, you know, why don't people just um, start doing something? Well, for a number of reasons. It's, 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 um, it's intellectually very difficult to grasp. It's emotionally extremely difficult to grasp. But more important is the fact that there's nothing in the history of the world com comparable to the way in which consciousness is, is controlled in today's society. And after all, it's capital that says nothing is sacred. If you can't monetize it, it drops out of capitalist calculation. For me, what I ultimately began to realize is that all these different crises, they were really a crisis of human consciousness, that our unconscious activity had inflicted all this stuff on the planet, on, on, on nature, on other people. Uh, you know, I've been exploring these uh, concepts of prophecies, you know, around the time that we're in. I'm wondering if the Lakota have a sense of uh, the, any significance of this time, or if they see a process underway that's, that's, that's going to have a certain outcome. Uh, and what they see is that outcome, possibly. Let me explain it this way, Daniel. In, in a way that um, I was told by an elder, the prophecy is already happening. It's not a timeline. It's not 2012. If we're present, we can see the future. We know what's happening because of our experience with the past. And the prophecies that we have are with something. You and I are a prophecy right here. And a lot of people are understanding it. They're looking at the, the weather forecast. They're looking at the, the yes, stock, stock indications. Stock yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm really a strong believer of the Bible. Like, the books of Revelation is definitely, like, happening, you know. Um, I don't know how crazy it is going to get, but, I mean, just from watching the news and watching everything, it's pretty nuts, you know. I think that there's tremendous expectations, uh, and there always have been throughout history, that some event is going to erupt into history. And that sort of leads into a, a wider area of concern about 2012. The Christians talk about Jesus is going to come and, you know, smite the, the sinners and save the saved. And the UFO uh, contingent says our alien space brothers are going to show up in mile-wide ships. And, you know, uh, it'll all be good after that. But in a way, we're shirking our responsibility, you know, to expect that that's going to happen. We can't be chosen people. There's no such thing. That, if you're chosen, then that leads easier to a, a redemption, a uh, evil and good, uh, a, uh, a salvation point mentality. Can you explain your concept a little bit? Yeah. Uh, salvation point mentality started with uh, things religion. Religion, somebody else is going to come and save you. Um, so we've given our power away to somebody else to fix the problem. And that, to me, has no, nothing to do with personal sovereignty. And we give you know, our power away in order to all, we'll train them to, to protect us. When we, we forget how to do all those things ourselves because that's the way of this society. Is remove your power and give it to something or a system so that that system can take care of you. Now, that's spiritually lazy. Jesus ain't coming. You know, the saucers ain't coming. I mean, maybe they will, maybe they will, but it's, it is nothing we can count on. But in the meantime, we have to be realistic and we have to, you know, really work seriously on, the, on this global consciousness change. Do you think there are any lessons to be learned today from the ancient Mayan civilization? Well, I think it's pretty well known now why the classic Maya civilization uh, had a downfall. The uh, Maya had certainly uh, increased their populations beyond the carrying capacity of the land, given their, their mode of agriculture and everything. They had almost all the forests cut down. At the same time, their warfare increases tremendously. Uh, it's like when a species goes extinct, it's usually not just one thing that's happening. It's a whole lot of things coming in at the same time uh, that it simply can't recover from. And the Maya could not rebound from this. Consideramos 
que el 2012 es un tiempo de coyuntura y por eso es que es importante hacer una reflexión para el género humano. Es el ser humano el que está forjando su propio destino. Western civilization at this moment is a loaded gun pointed at the head of this planet. We must come to a screeching halt now because we are barreling toward the brink of ruin. And uh, the only thing that I have ever seen that turned anybody around on the dime was psychedelics, <laughs> you know? When I explored psychedelics again, I got fascinated by the work of Terence McKenna, who talked about the history of human involvement with psychoactive plants, how they shaped culture, religion. McKenna advocated that you could actually make these explorations for yourself, rather than just reading about them in books or other people's testimonies. And ultimately, that really inspired me, and it gave me a sense of permission to have these experiences. Certainly, I encountered a lot of resistance. You know, my mother was not happy about it. My friends kind of laughed at me. But uh, ultimately, I uh, took from McKenna's work the sense that uh, it could be done and that you could actually grow and benefit from the experiences. So I decided, since I was a journalist and I had these tools, that I would go and, and explore this whole other form of uh, consciousness or awareness. For Vibe magazine, I ended up taking uh, Iboga in a uh, uh, initi initiation ritual in Gabon. So Iboga is a, is a root bark, and it was definitely like the worst tasting thing that I'd ever experienced. I just forced myself to eat as much of it as, as I possibly could get down, and even the king was ultimately impressed. He said, the, the, the journalist has eaten much, much, you know, so. <laughs> then I was like fr freaked out, like, well, I've eaten too much, am I gonna like die here? <laughs> There's, it's like a stern, ultimately just, but very tough father figure that um, has a really sardonic, almost like nasty sense of humor, which shows your own faults like over and over again, so you get the message. You know? So I was just showing these little movies of myself like drinking too much at cocktail parties and not like functioning well the next day, like over and over again, these little repeating loops. And you know, it, it had definitely had an effect. After the Boga experience, I radically cut down on my drinking. The main thing that, that struck me from that experience um, was one of the shamans said that when he looked at me, he could see the uh, spirit of my uh, mother's mother hovering over me, and that um, she had died recently, and she was protecting me. She was she was still possessive, and she was she was stopping me from seeing different aspects of the visionary worlds. And it was a very, um, you know, for me, a very interesting comment because actually my mother's mother had died in, in the last year and she'd actually been the only grandparent that I'd even known. And I, and I hadn't talked to anybody there about my family background or this was just not information that anybody in that group in Gabon would have had access to. So it was one of the first experiences or indications I, I had that shamans are actually capable of accessing this kind of... Um, uh, this other form of knowledge, you know, this other form of, of uh, uh, awareness where, where they bring in information that, that you couldn't access through ordinary channels. The shamanic process was characterized by Joseph Campbell as one of separation, initiation, and return. And what happens is that the shaman, the candidate, goes away from the tribe, he, he risks himself on a vision quest, and he receives new ideas, new myths, new information. And then he returns, and the tribe celebrates uh, his return, and they integrate these new visions. I think since the 1960s, many people in our culture have gone out, they've taken the shamanic journey, but there hasn't been a good way for them to return to the culture. Uh, when, when I went on these uh, shamanic journeys, they really had a transformative effect on me. They gave me a much deeper sense of my own agency, my capacities, the, my responsibility, really. 
I remember when I went down to the Amazon for the first time, and I visited the Sequoia, a small tribe in Ecuador, and uh, took ayahuasca with them. On the way, we passed through these huge areas where the forest had been cut down after oil companies came through. And it was really at that point I realized how unsustainable and even suicidal our culture was. And then during the ayahuasca experience, I seemed to receive a lot of messages about our responsibility for the planet and also our ability to go beyond our personal healing process in order to help the healing of the collective. Had you um, already started the Rainforest Foundation when you had that ayahuasca experience, or it kind of like was that one of it the was kind of kind of uh, happened at the, more or less the same time? You know, I, I went to the the rainforest before that, before I'd had the ayahuasca experience. But, and I suppose uh, has, has informed our work since then. How did you even like find out about it? I think um, about 20 years ago, I was in Brazil and I met somebody uh, in Copacabana. And Trudy and I, my wife, we got, got in the back of his car and we mysteriously led out of Rio through the favelas into the jungle. There's a big uh, church, and they handed out this brew. And Judy and I looked at each other and said, we're going to everybody drinking it, so we did. <laughs> I, I drank it in one. And then, after about 40 minutes, there's something coursing through every cell in my body, like uh, an intelligence searching for everything. And I am wired to the entire cosmos. <laughs> I look, I look at the ground and I see a crack in the ground and then inside that crack there's a little flower growing and I, it's my brother. <laughs> Every, everything. <laughs> and I realize for the first time this is the only genuine religious experience I've ever had. It is communion, this di direct access to the Godhead, whatever, whatever you think that is. I have no idea what it is, but there is definitely an intelligence a higher intelligence at work in you during this experience. If there is a message that psychedelics deliver, particularly ayahuasca, it's that we have to wake up. You know, we have to wake up to what we're doing to the planet. We have to wake up to this notion that we're separate from nature, that we own nature, that we can exploit nature, we can toxify it, we can pollute it. And we need to move more toward the indigenous perspective that we're stewards of nature. We're part of nature and we need to listen to the messages that nature is bringing us. And they're all over the place, you know. I mean, you just have to look. All around the world, there's the emergence of new kinds of consciousness. This ecological crisis that we're going through is potentially a unifying force. The potential in this time is enormous. And as you say, it's, it's a time for transformation. And as you say in your book, apocalypse means uncovering. It doesn't mean necessarily disaster. It means uncovering of reality. So we're facing reality and I think we can only really welcome that and be optimistic about it. The time frame toward 2012 I don't know but I do believe that there's a very short time frame here and I think that intending on a mass collective scale that we're going to take a jump by mass resonance, mass consciousness shift, mass connecting of what's creative could make the difference. So I say let's go for it. You know, we don't have an answer from these other cultures as to what this, what this transition means and what this next form of civilization would be like. So in a way, there's like an empty space for us to imagine and project and build and construct. This question of what will happen in 2012 may just be the wrong question, and we should just be really asking, you know, what are we going to do? Like, what can, we, what can we bring about? What type of change can we bring about in this time? It's going to be up to 
individuals and then communities to make a profound shift in how we're conducting ourselves on the planet. We have with us today an unusual person, rather a remarkable person. Mr. Fuller is described as an architect. He is that because of his intense concern with living space. But he is something more than an architect because his obsession is with the architecture of the universe. I think that with some kind of final examination as to whether human beings are qualified to take on the responsibility we desire to be entrusted with. And this is not a matter of examination of the types of governments, nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with the economic system. It's to do with the individual. Does the individual have the courage to really go along with the truth? Can you just define Buck Mr. Fuller, like who he was? Yeah, he was a, um, you know, he was often called the Leonardo da Vinci of the 20th century. He took a real intuitive thinking process and applied it toward looking at the Earth as a complete integrated whole system. There are a couple of things that just in the simplest way Bucky did. And the one that got me was in a little book called Utopia or Oblivion. And it was this phrase, we now have the resources, technology, and know-how to make the world 100% physical success for everyone without taking it away or destroying our environment. Just that idea shifts the worldview. Our resources, we now use them the way we've designed them. They can only take care of 44% of humanity. 56% of humanity is doomed to early demise. Therefore, the only way we can possibly take care of everybody is through a design revolution, doing more with less. I'm not trying to imitate nature, I'm trying to find the principles she's using. Only the individuals, like Mr. Fuller, living integrated life could be the representative of the scientific age, which is to leave its influence for thousands of generations to come. I f feel that Maharishi and I have come together both inspired by how we could turn that, the, the advantage to the, towards the many. So the way you would possibly get to a future like Bucky was seeing was about completely transforming your consciousness, loving one another as yourself, and orienting technology toward the good. So Bucky had a vision, and he saw that we had the resources and technology, but it was premature. It, it couldn't get applied yet. Both these things, knowledge and experience, makes life fuller. <laughs> One of the things I've learned about being part of this movement for the last 40 years is that we have seed ideas and we plant them. And sometimes it looks like they're not going to work but they're growing behind your back, so to speak. <laughs> Many of us in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and on have planted these viable seeds. The impacts of, of the, the 60s are a clear example of this social, big, huge change that can come through personal change using yourself to, to look for unity, you know? Taking care of the environment, of this, this ecological thing that we have so clearly established today was born then. I hear this uh, expression, the failed 60s. The 60s didn't fail. There was such an awakening and transformation in, you know, so many arenas like feminism and like organic food and music and art and yoga and philosophy that it's still reverberating through the planet. If I look at the 60s as maybe the first wave of a kind of initiatory process, it was like almost too much for 
people at that time, so it had to kind of go underground and take, you know, f take deeper roots, you know, so now they can maybe... We didn't have a lot of elders to figure yeah. it out. Exactly. And there was a lot of idealism, so there was a lot of, there was a lot of things that didn't work in the 60s that, have, that we have an understanding about. I see the 60s as the first phase in a shamanic voyage of initiation for the modern psyche. I think at that point, a huge amount of new material kind of erupted into our culture. We had movements for civil rights, environment, uh, world peace, exploration of consciousness, sexual liberation. But one problem was that we didn't have many elders around to guide people through the process. And, and at this point now, I think we are going through a second phase of this shamanic voyage for our culture. And now we do have elders in place, uh, people who've gone through their initiatory journey, who can kind of hold the space for everybody else. On a fundamental level, there's a, a deep shift in paradigm that's taking place. And that shift is away from the materialism, the greed, the, the ego-driven, profit-seeking kind of focus that, that people have had. We're recognizing that there's all these other dimensions of being that are really much more important than just accumulating stuff and accumulating goods. And that, and that I think once you make that shift in, in perspective, it, 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 it's a total change in orientation. In the Western world, our body went into a frontal plane, monoculture. You can wake up in the morning like this. You can eat like this. You can go in your car like this. You can be in your computer like this. That's kind of my lifestyle. Yeah, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is, the body is like, this is not right. It's just like if you surf or if you rock climb, whatever you engage in, that does start to shape your embodiment. Yoga starts to dismantle all of the things that are not deeply in sync. I'm now 57. I feel like I'm 20. I think largely through, through yoga, through being open to experiences, rather than you know, closing off and saying, I'm now finished. Mm -hmm. I consider myself, I always have done, a student or a work in progress. Uh, actually, one thing that's good about yoga, I always think that it's about getting comfortable in uncomfortable spots. Yeah. And that's what almost becomes, you can have like a yoga of uh, transformation, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think, how can I stay in this position longer than three seconds? And you, you end up there for an hour, and you realize that it's actually the most comfortable place you could ever be. But it's just that initial resistance to change, any change. You know, we don't like it, but it's essential. That's, that's how we progress. We put ourselves out of the comfort zone. So I heard that when you ended up in prison, that's when you actually started meditating. Is that true? Yeah. 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 How did that, that was come when about? I started meditating when I I started uh, fasting, having a different approach to to nourishment, together with the yoga that I also, the meditating and the hatha yoga that I I started also. I mean, it was a, a drastic change in in my my whole shape and. Uh, my whole physical and mental shape. I became another person, I, I would say. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I thought we'd talk about like, the Transcendental Meditation. Sure. I mean, um, this has become like a mission for you in the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been practicing Transcendental Meditation for almost 35 years, twice a day, every day, 35 years. Transcendental Meditation is a mental technique an ancient form of meditation. Maharishi gives mantras. Those mantras, because our senses are mostly pointed out there, the mantra turns the awareness within. Once it's turned within, you easily and effortlessly dive within. You transcend and experience pure consciousness. Whatever size ball of consciousness you had, it begins to expand. And associated with this deepest level are qualities, all positive, infinite intelligence, infinite creativity, infinite bliss, infinite energy, infinite love, power. I had so much anger and a lot of tension and stress, like everybody, 
And after just two weeks of diving within, this anger, and it went so naturally, I didn't even realize it, but my first wife comes to me and says, what's going on? I say, what are you talking about? She said, this anger, where did it go? I, you know, from the experiences I had in meditation, I really felt peace could happen. You know, I, I've, I've done Ashtanga yoga for, for, for many years. At the end of an Ashtanga session, you just sit quietly and, and you do enter a, an alpha state. It's not as, you know, for me, it's not as profound as the ayahuasca experience. Nonetheless, I can see how, by extension, you know, you just keep doing that and you can get to the same place, the same way you can do by fasting or meditation or whatever. But we're all going to this, the same area of the brain where we access this idea of the eternal, and uh, that's, that's really the goal. think about consciousness, when you tap into that intelligence, which is when people who are connected to nature, that's what we do. And you start to see this incredibly sublime, vast body of knowledge, wisdom, information that's coming out of the non-human world. It becomes like embedded in, in, in all of us that we need to we need to look after this and we need to protect this because this is it. I mean, this is our source of life. I just was out at um, an intentional community in Oregon studying permaculture. Can you tell me why you took it and what the vibe was like and what you found? Yeah, um, I decided to go because I had just finished a period of, uh, I'd say, a pretty substantial transition in my life. I think I, what I really needed to do when all that was over was just really connect myself to the ground. And, and when I got there and you know, one of the first days into it, I was like shoveling goat shit. And it felt so good. It was like, this is exactly, this is exactly what I want to be doing right now. The system of permaculture is, it's like a design science. You know, it's rooted in observation of natural systems. It's about think first, observe, taking what you see, you know, read the, the signs of nature, and then do because a lot of the agribusiness is like do, 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 and they don't think about what's happening. There's a set of principles and techniques and strategies, all very practical. What are the basic principles? Well, things like, you know, supporting biological diversity would be one. There's also things like how many functions can you get out of everything you do? And if you have a pond that, you know, cleans water, you might be doing aquaculture. Um, a greenhouse you might attach to your house and it heats and cools your house, it grows food, it might also process gray water, it might harvest roof water. It's a functional design. But I, I have to say, like, um, <clears throat> just thinking this out loud, and like, mm -hmm. like if I travel around, I think of these huge populations, millions and billions of people, I mean, most of the people on the planet are now probably being fed through the monoculture, agriculture system. Mm -hmm. You know, when I come to visit a permaculture settlement, it's like much smaller, much more intensive, much more particular. But it doesn't seem intuitively to me that, um, you know, what's going on in, 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 this, in, in, the, in these settings could feed those masses of people. The issue that you're talking about is all these vast amounts of, you see all these huge, you know, corn and wheat and soybeans. You know, those communities are not eating that food. When you have a diverse farm like what we have, our yields are much higher. My hope is that in local relationship to people in place, that that deepens more than it is now. 
It's not about having to be in a wilderness area. You know, Cuba, the majority of the food was grown in the cities for the whole island for years. A lot of food can be produced in small space. Uh, the water can be taken care of very, very nicely. So there are good examples. There are all the technologies. There are people willing to work for it. It's just a matter of, of start uh, doing it and, and reaching that changing point, the, the peak of, of the consciousness. So, John, tell me, what is the system that you've devised that treats water uh, in, in an ecologically sustainable way? Well, I call them eco-machines, and they've been used to grow foods, they've been used to treat waste, they've been used to uh, detoxify toxic compounds. So, I'm standing above a 12,000-gallon septic tank. We pull off the middle layer, which is gray water, sort of a greasy, oily substance, and bring it into the machine to treat it. You've got a whole series of tanks in a row. You then seed into them the intelligence of nature. For example, I would go to maybe a half a dozen different wild environments and bring the life from all of those places and put them in the tanks, because I knew that Nature had a way of dealing with almost every chemical and molecule. So when you assemble seven kingdoms of life, you're then created a eco-machine that is actually intelligent. It's got behind it hundreds of millions of years of practice. So water that has been as early as three days ago, toxic to humans and plants and most an other animals, uh, becomes fishable, swimmable by New York State standards. What I've dedicated my life to is to try and understand nature's operating principles and put them to work where possible toward human needs. We all know the Earth is in trouble. I often wondered if there was a united organization of organisms, otherwise known as uh-oh, <laughs> and every organism had a, had a right to vote. Will we be voted on the planet or off the planet? I think that vote is occurring right now. I want to present to you a suite of six mycological solutions us using fungi, and these solutions are based on mycelium. You've been speaking recently and uh, sort of discussing how mushrooms could help save the world situation. You know, how, how could us making a more conscious symbiotic relationship with fungus kind of help us leach out toxins and so on? Well, what few people realize is that fungi and the networks that they produce, which is called mycelium, it's the fine uh, fiber material that is virtually on all land masses of Earth. And what people uh, are, have been, and scientists in particular, have been slow to recognize is how critical th these fungal networks are uh, to ecological stability. So many habitats are threatened and they struggle to respond. And what these fungi do very quickly is remove the toxic uh, barriers that allow then these communities to thrive a lot more readily than they otherwise would occur. These are pictures of oyster mushrooms which can be used to break down oil that's collected on mats like these, which are made of human hair. Whether that pollution is uh, E. coli based, whether it is toxic chemicals from industrial sources, a, w a wide variety of pollutants can be captured by the mycelium that can then detoxify it. In the course of that, lead to habitat restoration.
So you think that somehow these mycelial bats are almost like uh, brains, or they're kind of, how, 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 what do they think about? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the mycelium is, is a neurological network of the planet. It's in constant biomolecular communication with this ecosystem. So if you take the mycelial mat in eastern Oregon, 2,200 acres in size, what is so cool about these mycelial networks is that if they encounter uh, a pathogen, for instance, at one side of the network, and they can articulate a response uh, in producing a novel antibiotic, that information transfers throughout the entire network. And so the organization of mycelium, of the computer internet, uh, of neurons, they all conform to the same archetype that, that, is, that is governed by string theory. I believe that this is not accidental. The mycelium has developed it, our brains have also developed it, and that our invention of the computer internet is an inevitable consequence of us repeating a previously successful paradigm. So what is uh, conscious evolution? <laughs> conscious evolution uh, is the evolution of evolution from unconscious to conscious choice. It's human life being intelligent enough to understand nature, to understand the process of evolution, and to suddenly wake up that it could destroy its own life support system by its own knowledge, like with the atomic bombs and then on and on with the environmental crisis. So we've been woken up to the fact that we are affecting evolution. We could destroy our own life. And there's also the glimmer at the edges that we could evolve our own life. We could cooperate with nature. We could align ourselves with the process that seems to lead to higher consciousness and more intelligence. As a species, we evolved through crisis. I don't, I don't think we would have left the sea if it hadn't, hadn't been some sort of crisis in the sea. You know, there wasn't enough oxygen in the sea, so we moved out. I think the crisis is there to, to trip us into the next, literally trip us into the next level of our uh, existence as, as a species. interested in uh, concepts from Peter Russell, who's looked at how if you look at um, successive revolutions in human culture, society, and consciousness, they seem to happen exponentially faster in linear time. You know, so the agricultural age took thousands of years to develop. Uh, then we had the industrial age, which took hundreds of years, the industrial revolution. Then we had the information age, or the knowledge revolution, which took tens of years. And each of these revolutions was built on the past one. So Peter Russell argues that we could be on the cusp of another revolution in human culture and consciousness, which he talks about the, the, the wisdom revolution or the wisdom age. So you know, if we had agriculture in thousands of years, industry in hundreds of years, information in tens of years, potentially we could have wisdom in like two to three years. You know? You know, you've been studying um, psychic phenomena and sort of trying to create a um, foundation for people to accept the validity of, uh, you know, psychic effects that are, that are measurable. Uh, what would be kind of your best evidence, that, or your best argument that, 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 that uh, these psychic effects are legitimate and, and, and deserve, you know, scientific uh, care and scrutiny? Well, the phenomena, the experiences, deserve serious investigation because people keep reporting them. These effects have been around since the beginning of history and they're not going away no matter how sophisticated we get. So as a scientist then, uh, and trained as an engineer in, a, in psychology, uh, I felt that it would be interesting if we could use the tools of science to look into these phenomena and see whether these were real or not. And the, the essence of this was you want to find a system which is very easy to push around like a feather and to see whether with your mind you can make it do stuff so you can create a random number generator which is like a coin flipper and see whether or not asking somebody to try to make more heads than tails would the device do that so this kind of experiment uh, was done at princeton it's been done many other places and the preponderance of that data shows very clearly the system complies so then we got the idea this was partially because in 1995 was the O.J. Simpson verdict, where probably close to a billion people around the, the world were 
going to pay attention to a single moment in time. So I had three random number generators, and I asked Roger at Princeton and a colleague uh, in Amsterdam, we'll all run our generators at the same time and see if they all change. And sure enough, they did. We had odds of 1,000 to 1 right at the moment that the verdict was read. Lowenthal, James Simpson, not guilty of... So from a science point of view, it's as though we're still Benjamin Franklin. We, we know how to fly the kite. We can create these little sparks in the laboratory. Doesn't happen every single time, but it happens often enough that we, we we're reasonably sure that these things are real, the sparks are real. So if uh, belief and attention have a uh, powerful effect on social reality and maybe even like physical reality, you know, what, what does that mean about this whole like 2012 phenomenon? I think if a lot of people are led to expect that something horrendous is going to occur, it's much more likely to occur. It doesn't necessarily mean it will, but it's much more likely. So part of what we can do is social engineering to, to get people to look at the positive side of big transformational changes. The economics we have now is you, you grow, 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 and that's how capitalism defines health. Last year at the Bali Conference on Climate, nobody talked about, about city design or, or city structure at all. It just didn't come up. The biggest thing human beings create. I mean, to me, this is an amazing puzzle that we could not see this gigantic thing that we live in. I mean, you look out here, and all you see is city. We're surrounded by city for miles and miles. They, they don't even talk about it, and yet a European city is, you know, averages about a third the land area for the same lifestyle, about a third the ener energy consumption. That's big. You're talking 66% savings in energy just by going to the European mode of the city. And they're stuffed with cars anyway. So what if you came out of the city that wasn't stuffed with cars? You're talking about saving maybe 80 or 90% of your energy. We had this idea in Berkeley to work with transit and energy conservation. But they wouldn't go for it because it actually would mean some kind of a significant change in the land use pattern. So. When this is the case, you say, well, wait a minute. Here you say you're very concerned about climate change. And here you say, you know, energy is a big problem. Well, here's the solution. Let's go for it. And they say, well, but not that solution. So I think what happens very frequently is that people just don't really want to sacrifice. They don't want to face really difficult changes. It sounds to me from what you're saying that, like, uh, um, and once again, maybe this is a theme of our film, that part of what's lacking is, is a, a coherent positive visions that people would have a sense of what they're moving towards because you know they don't want to think about what they're giving up you know if they have to give up comfort and the car and all that stuff that's just negatives you know so how would you present this as like you know what's the super positive new life pattern that people would be having if mm -hmm. they followed this kind of path you know well there's different different notions of prosperity what if prosperity is very flamboyant exciting buildings with rooftop gardens and bicycles and streetcars and uh, solar greenhouses but it's up to people somewhere in their you know deep in their heart to say you know I want to build a different world and I'm willing to face some serious change there's a Nietzsche quote that I used in 2012 um, he says that the deed creates the doer almost as an afterthought you know, so that the transformation of consciousness that we are capable of as individuals and on a species level, it, it comes out of uh, the deeds that we do in, the, in this time that's available to us to potentially bring about a, a huge transformation on this planet. I've seen a lot of very wealthy people that spend a lot of time never sharing who are on a spiritual quest. I see other people who don't seem to be on a spiritual quest at all. They're always helping other people, and they actually have a, a material contribution to other people that's uh, spiritual in my mind because it, it helps. In other words, I think spirit is as spirit does largely. I don't think you get there just by wanting to be there and by meditating. I think meditating can help. I think many things can help to, uh, to enhance as a discipline your recognition of where you are and who you are and when you are in, in the world. 
But I think it ultimately comes down to, are you going to do something about it? Although I think it's really you know, important to recognize the, the spiritual and psychic and consciousness aspects of this transformation, I think that we do actually have to address it viscerally, materially, technically, uh, and sustainably. You know, at the moment, we have this, all this technical genius in this society, you know, like people at Microsoft and Google and Apple, and they're making these, you know, iPods and widgets and so on, you know, so, so why can't we repurpose the technical genius of the modern Western consciousness to sustainability? My name is Ryan Martina. Um, I've been working in the area of battery and energy technologies. You know, electrical power is political power. This is what my couple of years in DC taught me. You know, a pyramid structure. And so I became dedicated to figuring out how to change that pyramid structure and flatten it. I want to enable people to make their own energy. Mm -hmm. and the larger goal of, of, of doing this uh, research is to see if you can create an engine that would run on water. Exactly. So I watched a bunch of YouTube videos to prepare for this. <laughs> I also did a PhD in chemical engineering where I was <laughs> <laughs> learned about cell design. So the thought is that there are engines that run on hydrogen, right? So but where do you get the where do you get the hydrogen from? Well, if you do electrolysis, you can go ahead and like carry your water on board and feed that to your combustion engine. No chance that we could like blow up here or anything like that. Um there is. <laughs> Add a little tap water, LA City tap water. Throw the power on. We're at five, six. Now we got some bubbles going. Do you believe that a um, engine has been created that runs um, entirely on water at this point? Absolutely. We can go ahead and run that little scooter on this system right here. So despite all the problems we're facing, this really is an amazing time. Uh, we're seeing that through the internet, uh, new ideas, new information can spread incredibly quickly. Someone can create a new invention, put up a video about it, the next day 30 million people can see it and potentially make their own uh, version of it. We're seeing all these new ways for people to come together and collaborate. The social networks on the internet, I think, you know, everybody is now linked together almost constantly. And in a sense, it's as if we're becoming a, a global tribe. In the digital world, they talk about open source as a model. And open source is a way that collaborators anywhere on the planet can connect with each other and work together to build a new piece of software, you know, whatever they need. It's possible that this collaborative model can, could replace the uh, corporate and hierarchical systems that people have been used to. In the future, we may really enter a new world where uh, manufacturing becomes open source. Agriculture becomes open source. Even money becomes an open source project. The challenge that we're dealing with gives us the opportunity, actually the obligation in my opinion, to change paradigm, to go to another level of complexity of organization in our society. Right. And doing that with a Stone Age concept of a single currency is just not even part of the matter. You put in one pot all patriarchal societies, whether it's in China, Mesopotamia, the Greeks, the Romans, the Renaissance, and us today, okay? All of them have a monopoly of a centralizing currency with positive interest rates. And that's issued from the top. It's actually a way of extracting resources to the top through, through interest, right? Interest is actually extracting resources from the people who don't have enough money to the people who have already a lot, right? That's what the definition of the process is. Well, interest is uh, a way of actually, if you want to have some security in life, you need to accumulate money. And you live from the interest, right? So we're talking the greed process. So what's your, what's your kind of basic proposal uh, as to how to uh, you know, kind of adjust the, 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 the basic underlying design principles of the system? What you need is diversity of currency tools. But different types of money create different type of behaviors. 
You don't deal with your frequent flyer miles the same way with dollars. Okay? That's one example which has no, not much of a social benefit, like how do you take care of elderly people? Uh, how do you give incentives to, for, for people to think about the environment? Uh, how do you, you know, uh, I mean, there's a whole series of tools. Can you give me some examples? All right. Um, let me give you the, the Japanese Furia Kipu example. Furia Kipu translates literally as a caring relationship ticket. One Furia Kipu is one hour that I spend on helping an elderly or a handicapped person. It's a time-based currency where one hour of this kind of services you get into in your account. It's electronic, okay? So it's a savings account. What can I do with that? Well, first application is, let's say I have a clue, and well, uh, I give a phone call and someone picks up my kids that are part of the network. It's not just an unknown person, you know, it's someone I can rely on, right? Oh. Now, what's fascinating is that they made a survey among the elderly people themselves, uh, and uh, they asked the following question. What do you prefer? Uh, the services provided by people who are uh, paid in yen, in the national money, or services provided in Furia Kipu. Universal answer, Furia Kipu. Why? The relationship is different. That little old lady in my street represents my mother. So if her rice needs to be cooked a little more, I will do that. That feels itself. It's, they perceive that. So we have an actually a demonstration here that different types of money create different relationships. It's one of cooperation rather than competition. We're all made up of what Earth is made up of, same thing. And in the Lakota language, the old traditional old language has no work for I or me. It's based on this, this concept, is that your body is in the soul, rather than you have a soul separate from everything else. If you're into a, a state of consciousness where your body is in the soul, it makes you really more, you're joined with a bigger power. Actually, you're responsible for that power and in treating life, all life, not just human beings as equals, but all life, even the stone that we're standing on. intelligent universe and we have to become more intelligent rather than less and what we need to do is build that we, those wheels of co-creation and start bringing innovative and creative people from different functions together to look at the synergy of what we already find we can do because it's coming together as a whole that we can take the jump of this event, uh, what, why, why? The value of an event like this is bringing people together in person to bring the spirit, the embodied spirit together. And then from that, we start to recognize the power that we have as a collective. We issue money by lending it into existence. If you start up a local currency, a complementary currency, you don't have to think of it as a currency that's going to be lent into existence by a bank. If you were to harvest all of the rain that falls on the typical brownstone or townhouse roof a year, you'd have enough water to flush all the toilets in that whole four-story building for a regular, you know, a good-sized family for like seven years. I don't think we have to suffer. I don't think that is the best way of solving our problems. Let's first of all shift consciousness so we actually become aware of what we're doing. We're, you know, we have a blind spot. We believe that's the only way. Well, wake up, wake up. 
I think there needs to become a generation of people who see cities as scaffolding for living systems. <laughs> Look at half of these buildings and say, okay, yeah, this is uh, what's going to support what I'm going to be doing. I would have a surface area requirement that for every square foot of pavement is created, we have a square foot of forest that is being created. Yeah, I'm a tree hugger. I'm a <laughs> self-confessed, card-carrying tree hugger. We think that one of the roles of consciousness is to get to a better cycle of consciousness, you know. We have to give our contribution to that. It doesn't happen by somebody snapping their fingers. And people have to do something to make it happen. We have, I think, it's something like 900 million combustion cars on this, on this planet. It's going to take 20 years to phase those out. Well, this is a solution. We can go ahead and put electrolysis cells right into gas tanks. What this really shows is you know, a little bit of imagination can make stuff like this happen. can create a washing machine with an exercise bike and use a pulley system to attach it to the, the motor of the washing machine, ride your bike for 20 minutes and you've just washed your clothes. It's like, let's kill 30 birds with one stone, you know? But don't kill birds. <laughs> <laughs> All these individuals are going to add up to a huge mass, and, and that is certainly going to be very impactful. I mean, that is the big challenge, I think, to not only hear the message, but somehow integrate the message and act on the message. I mean, all these things have existed there in seed form, and now we have a short period of time to make those seeds blossom and flourish. And then I do think we can move from, you know, survivalism or sustainability to a, a flourishing and thriving global society. Because, you know, na nature doesn't sustain itself, it flourishes and thrives, and we're part of nature, so we should do the same thing. If we can build our soil back up again um, on all the arable land on the planet, I mean, let's not think small here, um, we could start to bring our CO2 levels down to pre-industrial levels. I'm making a material that's a sustainable version of cement. So this is extremely light, yes. but it's strong enough to put up a building. Yeah, what we're doing here is building a system for treating sewage. It actually produces bananas, which is a very economic way of turning a usual problem into a resource. Usually a building, when it uh, no longer functions, it has to be torn down. In this case, uh, all of the components can easily be taken apart and without being destroyed and then reassembled in a completely different way. The idea that a city like New York City could become a, a farm area. Uh, we have all these rooftops, we have all these places that we could grow food. In fact, we, we have enough area in New York City to grow 80% of all the vegetables that New York City would ever need. Really? How is it? Delicious.
So I think people are going to get it, and that's what I'm, I'm trusting. And then the so-called new world or new hope or whatever they're believing in, it'll be here. It's already here. Yeah, that's really it. Buscar você de vez pra mim 